This audio production was made in collaboration with Audible Anarchist. Part 7. Pleasure. 79. Bourgeois political economy, the science of the exchange value, was always only the false consciousness of the economy and the science of alienation. This is the first and final message of its Marxian critique. With the dying out of exchange value, the science of use value, thus all the concrete sciences now unified through their unified subjective use, will become the only useful science. And the science of use value is the science of pleasure. 80. Real economy, savings, consists in the saving of working time, the minimum and reduction to the minimum of production costs. But this saving is identical with the development of productivity. Economizing, therefore, does not mean the giving up of pleasure, but the development of power and productive capacity, and thus both the capacity for and means of enjoyment. The capacity for enjoyment is a condition of enjoyment, and therefore its primary means. And this capacity is the development of an individual's talents, and thus of the productive force. To economize on labor time means to increase the amount of the free time i.e. time for the complete development of the individual, which again reacts as the greatest productive force on the productive force of labor. From the standpoint of the immediate production process, it may be considered as production of fixed capital, this fixed capital being man himself. It is also self-evident that the immediate labor time cannot remain in its abstract contradiction to free time as in bourgeois economy. Work cannot become a game, as Fourier would like it to be. His great merit was that he declared that the ultimate object must be to raise to a higher level not distribution, but the mode of production. Free time, which includes leisure time, as well as time for higher activities, naturally transforms anyone who enjoys it into a different person, and it is this different person who then enters the direct process of production. The man who is being formed finds discipline in this process, while for the man who is already formed, it is practice, experimental science, materially creative and self-objectifying knowledge, and he contains within his own head the accumulated wisdom of society. 81. The major shortcoming of contemporary individuals is their incapacity for pleasure. Our daily lives are impoverished, in part because we are open to the world, and therefore to pleasure, as well as to pain, only in such narrow and limited ways. These are the defenses, the character armor, congruent with a world overloaded with pain, a world of suffering, which was and is the world of poverty, with its struggle for existence, its war of all against all, where to be open is to be weak, and to be weak is to be made a victim. The self-contradiction of bourgeois egoism sharpens and becomes conscious only in the environment of that incipient world of plenty and world of pleasure which bourgeois society, during the prosperity phase of its economic cycle, itself foreshadows. That is, only when the walls which lock out pain begin to be perceived in daily experience as walls which lock out pleasure. The struggle against the social organization for pain and for the social organization for pleasure is the revolutionary struggle. The problem, formulated another way, is the present narrow character of the appropriation of nature and human nature by man. 82. In the revolutionary process, the struggle is the struggle of pleasure. The pleasure is the pleasure of struggle. 83. Today, people oppress each other by the smallness of their desire, their poverty of social needs, their lack of a fuller egoism, a fuller greed. We are asking people to ask for more, so that we can ask for more, and get more from them, get what we can only get by being allowed to give more. We do not ask you for much, we ask from you only your own egoism, and we do so not out of altruism but for our own egoistic reasons. From the depths of our own, we ask you for the depths of yours. But in asking you for that, we ask you to give everything you've got, to give your all. 
84. Positive human self-consciousness can only be guiltless egoism, which can only mean communist egoism. The egoism which does not include the pleasure of other egos, but on the contrary appropriates this as its own pleasure, includes it precisely for its own selfish reasons. 85. The negatively self-conscious egoist is the guilty egoist, the egoist who strives after his own narrow desires guiltily and thus works against himself, resists himself, opposes a part of his own energy to his own project. It is the energy presently tied up in guilt, in self-policing, in self-repression, character armor, which, once freed, can build the new world. People seeking, in good conscience and without guilt, more pleasure for their own everyday lives contain the whole of the revolution. 86. Self-sacrifice is always Christian. Always. 87. The expansion of egoism refers not only to the expansion of self-identity over many selves at any one time, but also to its expansion over time at any one self. The sacrifice of a future greater pleasure to a more immediate but lesser one is precisely that, sacrifice, not the other way around. The responsible individual must decide for himself what is to his greatest advantage. This theory is no morality that can decide for him. The theory and practice of expanded egoism can have no consort with any ideology of hedonism, any more than with any brand of puritanism. This theory and practice is inseparable from the expanded consciousness of pleasure whose possibility has developed in the historical labor process, in the expansion of human capacities, self-powers, and needs, and it is inseparable, no less, from that pleasure of consciousness which it implies and contains and which simultaneously contains it. Self-discipline, as directly opposed to authoritarian discipline, externally imposed and internalized as such, the coherent use of my life for myself, according to my own imminent standards and to ends of my own, is in itself already a pleasure for me. Self-mastery, the conscious and effective wielding of myself for myself in the world is indeed an aesthetic self-pleasure. It is the art of life. When myself is the work of my own art, and my own work of art, then I take pleasure in myself. Then I know myself as wealth, for myself as well as for others. I know myself as rich, as rich in myself as a wealthy man through my self-possession. And yet this subjective wealth, this richness in self which I possess, is also society. This is proven by the fact that outside society, or without it, all my wealth would wither into dust. The identity of myself and my society is proven by the fact that the non-existence of society implies the non-existence of myself. But this is a dialectical, mediated identity, not a formal, abstract, immediate one, an identity that preserves within itself the moment of differentiation. This has been a production of Audible Anarchist. You can find more Audible Anarchist on YouTube.